lot of people have heard of Victoria's Secret, but very few people have heard of the billionaire behind it, Les Wexner. Les Wexner owns some of the most popular stores you've seen at the mall, but his ties to sex offender Jeffrey Epstein have raised a lot of questions in recent years. I'm Anjanette Levy, and welcome to this latest edition of Law and Crime Sidebar Podcast. This new documentary has just come out on Hulu, uh, and it looks really interesting. Les Wexner is from Columbus, Ohio. He is a billionaire, and he owns a, a lot of big brands. He owns Victoria's Secret. He used to own The Limited, uh, Abercrombie and & Fitch, a lot of these stores that we've all done some shopping at over the years. And uh, there have been a lot of questions about him and Jeffrey Epstein. So joining me to talk about this is Sharina Anki Kroll. She is a business attorney and a frequent guest on Law and Crime. So Sharina, thank you so much for coming on. We appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. It's always a pleasure to speak with you. You too. Um, so this new documentary on Hulu is called Victoria's Secret, Angels and Demons. And it looks really at the downfall of Victoria's Secret. It's still at the mall. You know, I walk past it all the time, but I can tell you, I never go in there. I don't know why. I just don't. You know, I it's just not appealing to me for some reason anymore. Um, so what what is the deal with Les Wexner and Jeffrey Epstein, and how could that have impacted that relationship he had with them? How could that have impacted his business? Sure. So from my understanding, uh, Jeffrey Epstein was very close with Wexler. Wexler allowed him to manage, from what I understand, a lot, if not all of his finances, and he gifted him a couple of houses, allowed him to allow uh, Epstein to live within a mile of his estate. Um, so a lot was going on. And what was really striking to me is that Wexler gave power of attorney to Jeffrey Epstein, which is very strange and very unusual because we don't really see that happening with anyone outside of someone's family, for, for example. It's someone usually that's very close to you. So that relationship, just by the fact, if we even ignore everything else, the fact that he, um, the fact that Wexler gave Epstein power of attorney is very questionable. Um, you know, we want to know more about what that relationship entailed, why that was done, um, just to see, you know, what else was happening. Jeffrey Epstein took a lot of secrets to the grave with him, and there were a lot of there were a lot of reports out there that Jeffrey Epstein was involved in blackmailing very famous people, and there were even some people concerned that he might have been blackmailing Les Wexner. And when all of these ties to these famous people started coming out in 2018 and 2019, Sharina, um, you know, he stepped back from his role at his company in 2020. Do you think that that's not a coincidence? I mean, how how could it how could that be a coincidence? You know, I don't think it's a coincidence because, as you know, a lot of the companies, especially Victoria's Secret, has been on its way down. It's kind of spiraling on its way down for years now, um, mainly because I think you know it has the company has lost its touch with the new age consumers. Um, but I think you know it's not a coincidence because. The company just cannot handle any more bad press right now on top of what's already happening. So by kind of removing Wexner from the scene, um, maybe the company is trying to just re-merge, rebrand in, in a certain level. Yeah, it seems like that that would be a good thing to do is to maybe take him out of the mix, get somebody else involved. And I do want to mention that there were some allegations that Jeffrey Epstein had actually sexually assaulted somebody at one of Les Wexner's properties years and years ago. And Les Wexner um, apparently said he cut ties with Jeffrey Epstein in 2007. This uh, alleged sexual assault um, happened at, in 1996 uh, at Wexner's estate in the Columbus, Ohio area. So he still was with the, he was still working with Jeffrey Epstein for some time. Um, that could just be absolutely poisonous to a business empire, wouldn't you say? Absolutely. I mean, you know, if that is true, currently it's just an allegation, right? It ha nothing has been proven yet. If that's true, I mean, it's, you know, I, I feel like the entire empire um, is going to be coming down, right, for, for Wexner. 
So, um, you know, the question now is, was that actually the truth? I know uh, from doing a little bit of research that the woman that's making these allegations stated that she tried to make a complaint with the sheriff um, at Wexner's estate where she was staying. But the conflict is that the sheriff's office was apparently also hired by Wexner to watch his estate at that time where she was staying. So there's a lot of stuff going on that we don't really know the, you know, the very fine details of, which will definitely um, impact the outcome. Most certainly. Uh, it, it's an interesting story. Um, the docuseries looks very interesting, and I think we'd all like to hear more from Les Wexner about this. So Sharina Anki crawl a business attorney, thank you so much, as always, for coming on. We appreciate it. Thank you. Actor Kevin Spacey appeared in court this week. You probably know him from a number of movies. I know I loved him in House of Cards on Netflix, uh, but he is charged with some sex crimes over in the UK. And joining us to talk about that is UK solicitor Lizette Aguilar. She is with Keystone Law over there in London. Lizette, welcome back to Sidebar. Thanks so much for coming on. Hello, Angela. It's great to be back with you. Let's uh, let's talk about the very latest. Kevin Spacey was uh, in court on Thursday. He pleaded not guilty to the charges. So take us to the scene. I know you were actually there. So tell us what it was like outside of the courthouse. There were a lot of media outside the courthouse, which is the central criminal court in London called the Old Bailey, which is an extremely historic criminal court, the oldest, and a lot of very famous, indeed notorious trials have taken place there. And I think he was moved there because it's such a high profile case. There were um, reporters and photographers waiting outside the door for him to come out. And indeed, when he went in, there was a little barrier. But when he did come out, you could actually get really close to him. So everybody was taking photographs. A car had been brought round, there were police there. A car had been brought round to collect him, so he only had to walk a short way. But even in that short distance, there was a scrum and one man fell over. At one point, I actually thought it was Kevin Spacey who was wearing a blue suit. And this man was also wearing a blue suit. It wasn't Kevin Spacey. He managed to get into the car unharmed. But it is an indication of how desperate people were to see him. The hearing itself was actually only very short, about 15 minutes. And he pled, as you said, not guilty to all five counts. What you're describing uh, sounds very intense, obviously. Why is this case so important in the UK? I know that he ran a theater company there uh, for quite some time and it was quite successful. Um, but it, but is, there, is there more to this? Because it seems like Kevin Spacey is, you know, he's been over in London for quite some time now. Um, you know, he, he has ties there. Is that part of this? Yes, I think in some ways he's considered to be sort of a Londoner because he was artistic director of the Old Vic Theatre for many years. And as you say, he made it really a success. Um, also, because the nature of the crimes is is quite shocking, given that he's a celebrity and one of them is a serious sexual offence. So I think all of that put together really... Uh, generates a lot of interest in the case and in, will continue to do so. The trial uh, will be on the 23rd of, sorry, it will be in June 2023, starting early June for three or four weeks. And I can imagine that the attention then will be absolutely intense and that the courtroom will be packed. Is that typical for there to be such a long period of time in the UK uh, from uh, an arraignment uh, per se to um, the trial? Is that common? Yes, yes, that's quite common. It usually takes, well, several months, if not a year to actually get to trial. So that's not a surprise in itself. There may be some pretrial motions before that. And this will be a, a jury trial. We've talked about that before. And the jurors, there's no jury selection, per, you know, as we would have it over here in the United States. I think you told us the last time that they're just summoned. And, and basically, that's yes. who you get. Anyone can be summoned. It's completely random. And you actually have to have a good excuse not to do your jury duty. So uh, whoever gets this summons will be in for a very, very interesting case. You know, what's interesting to me, too, um, Kevin Spacey, he walks out. Obviously, you know, he's a he's a performer 
And he is coming out of the courthouse. Um, you know, when I've seen him, at least he appears to not, he looks not too worried. <laughs> I, I, and I, maybe some of that is for the cameras, but you know, these are very serious charges over there in the UK. So, so what do you think of this? Do you think that he thinks this is maybe something he will win because over here in the U S in Massachusetts, the case was later dropped. Uh, so do you think that he actually believes that or, or what's your take on that as an attorney? I think that the fact that he voluntarily came to the UK to be formally charged in the first place and that he has again appeared in person um, really speaks to his confidence that the, these charges will be dismissed. Having said that, they are very serious charges and he will have to go, of course, through the whole trial process. When he came out of the court, I wouldn't say he was interacting in any way with anybody who was outside. He seemed to want to get to the car as quickly as possible, which is understandable. Oh, very understandable. And I'm assuming he had people with him, security, things like that, um, you know, like yes, an entourage of sort. It was a small entourage, actually. He seemed to have one, maybe two lawyers with him and a security person. But there were also City of London police officers around, um, obviously, to make sure, you know, that the crowd didn't pressure him or hassle him in any way. Let's just go over those charges again, um, just br just briefly, Lizette, just in case our viewers don't recall um, what exactly the charge, what, what are the charges that he's facing? What is he accused of? He's accused of four counts of sexual assault and one count of uh, causing a person to engage in sexual activity without consent. And that's the serious offense, which is why it has gone to the Crown Court and in fact to the, the, the most famous Crown Court, which is the Old Bailey. Um, and in terms of those offences, in terms of how they kind of play out, uh, there are two which date back to 2005 in London. Those are two counts of sexual assault against one man. Then there is a count of sexual assault and the serious sexual offence against another man a bit later, I believe it was 2008. And then finally, a count of sexual assault in 2013. So these are three men, uh, you know, with whom he has co com committed these alleged offenses. And the men are now in their 30s or 40s. Yeah. Uh, and so, yeah, it's interesting that some of these are these allegations are so old. Um, but that often happens in sex cases where People are reluctant to come forward, and maybe once things started trickling out about him, then they felt more comfortable doing so, I'm assuming. Yes, it's possible. And the the, the two earlier offences allegedly took place in London, and then the later offence took place in Gloucestershire, which is a, a county outside London. Well, Lizette Aguilar, uh, we appreciate you coming by to talk with us about this and, and your insight and your on-the-scene uh, description of what was going on outside the courthouse. Appreciate your time, as always. Thank you so much for having me, Anjanette. I've got an insatiable appetite for life, and I want more, more, more. That is Vince McMahon, and he is the head of WWE, and he has been surrounded by controversy lately. Recently, the Wall Street Journal reported that over 16 years, he paid out $12 million in hush money over sexual misconduct claims against him and claims of infidelity. His wife, of course, is heavily involved in WWE, and now even Netflix has pulled a documentary that has been in production about him. So joining me to talk about this is Luke Owen. He's the general manager of of Wrestle Talk and host of the Wrestle Talk podcast on YouTube. Luke, welcome to Sidebar. Thanks for coming on. Thank you for having me again. It's a real pleasure to be here. Luke, tell us about the latest on Vince McMahon. I kind of summarized it there, but there's a lot going on uh, with these allegations and the information that keeps trickling out around him. Yeah, so the the story that came out a couple of weeks ago uh, was that you know, just the one case uh, that had been sort of been brought against him and the board of directors said they were going to investigate things and he stepped down as the CEO. His daughter, Stephanie McMahon, took over as the interim CEO while Vince remained in charge of creative, which basically what that means if you're not a wrestling fan is that he books the shows. He decides what happens on all of the TV shows. Uh, he is the one who decides all the storylines, all of the matches and the match finishes. So he is still very much kind of 
of in control of, of that aspect of things. The new stories that have come out against him are slightly more, uh, I think, from a sort of a public perspective, are slightly more damaging to his character than the other ones. Well, like going by our own audience, you know, we kind of saw sort of people being split into two camps. Some people was like, well, this is very bad. And then other people being like, well, it was just an affair. That's nothing really illegal. Maybe we shouldn't be so harsh on him. But however, these ones are a, a lot more damaging to the Vince McMahon character, I feel. And what has his character been, you know, out there? I mean, I've seen him. He's kind of an over the top character, right? I mean, and he's he's out there. He's the head of this like kind of outrageous show. I mean, let's face it. WWE is there's it's show business, right? There's a show business aspect to this. So he's a showman. Um, so what what is his character in this whole, um, you know, business, this industry? I mean, he is the he's the ringmaster. He is the guy that's going out there and is controlling the circus. And, you know, like on TV, he hasn't been much of a focal point for a number of years. However, like last November, all of a sudden he became a weekly character on TV again uh, with a character named Austin Theory. And he was sort of like mentoring this new and upcoming uh, bad guy. Uh, he then had a match at WrestleMania uh, against Pat McAfee and uh, was sort of quite, actually quite praised for his performance in the match considering how old he is. And uh, it, since then, he's sort of, been off tv however since all of these allegations have come out against him he has sort of brought himself back onto tv but not in a storyline uh, perspective he now just comes out on tv he's done it a handful of times just to come out and say things to the crowd like welcome the crowd to the show very much show that sort of like the kind of reading of it is to show that he is not bothered by these allegations he is not phased by these allegations that come against him in fact fightful select reported that his attitude is a defiance in, in terms of these allegations and the uh, mike johnson of pw insider said that on friday smackdown which airs on fox it was business as usual he was not talking about the the uh, the wall street journal article uh, if anything it was the uh, i believe the quote was it was the elephant in the room that wasn't being discussed I, I'm most certain. I'm certain of that. It was the elephant in the room. It, it seems like this probably was not that big of a secret. Yes, it's in the media right now. But typically, when things like this happen, I feel like people have always known, or it's been kind of an open secret in that particular industry or in those circles. So, is there a little bit of that going on here too? Within the wrestling world, uh, sort of about 10, 15, maybe 20 years ago, there was a very popular form of media for wrestling fans called shoot interviews. And that was essentially wrestlers from the 80s and 90s and sometimes the 70s sat in hotel rooms being asked by a guy with a camcorder, tell me some stories. You know, here's what happened on this show. What were your memories of that? And it became this very popular thing. And within those shoot interview series, numerous stories were told about various people. And it's always been this kind of like wrestling has been, this, it's always been sort of seen as this seedy underbelly of things and last couple of years ago it had its own me too movement which was called speaking out uh where a lot of names came forwards uh that were uh, had very bad things against them said against them a lot of which was proven to be true and a lot of them found themselves without jobs and they were fired from companies have not been able to be booked anywhere since uh but there were some names that kind of escaped out of that there were some people who assumed that vince would be one of those but he wasn't uh and i think it was just sort of presumed hey maybe there isn't actually that anything bad against him it's just maybe all, maybe all we've ever heard is rumor and innuendo and there's nothing actually true uh but now there's these allegations um have come out against them that he's allegedly done uh that's you know maybe maybe there's more to it but we obviously we don't know until the board finishes their investigation and it says that uh the board of wwe is also investigating the head of talent relations for similar inappropriate relationships with the same staffers as mcmahon uh that sounds a little wild yeah, I mean, John Laurinaitis, uh, or Johnny Ace, uh, as he's sort of more commonly known amongst wrestling fans, he has been ousted from the company. He has not been at TV. Um, sort of the, the scuttlebutts um, is kind of, he's going to be seen as the scapegoats to this. Um, when Laurinaitis was brought in, there were reports, um, from, particularly from Fight for Select, that said that female talent weren't happy that he was back in the company because he has a, uh, reportedly has a view of what women's wrestling should be, which is they should be out out there to be eye candy to be sex symbols and this and the other whereas opposed to more recently within the last five seven years the that attitude has changed within wwe to uh, show their female wrestlers as performers as actual athletes 
Um, so there was a concern that they may go back to uh, the, what was called the Divas era of WWE, which were short matches, uh, wrestling in gravy, wrestling in pools, and, and this and that and the other. And yeah, John Laurinaitis has always had very bad things said about him in those two interviews I referenced earlier uh, and within sort of wrestling media and stuff. Um, so yeah, it, it, John Laurinaitis is one of those, again, like when the stories came out, I was like, that's kind of unsurprising that it's Johnny Ace. Um, but yeah, reportedly he is out of the company and has been sent home uh, with Bruce Pritchard taking over his role. And Stephanie McMahon, Vince McMahon's daughter, I guess, is currently serving as the interim CEO uh, and chairwoman of WWE. And she stepped, uh, her dad stepped down, I should say, while there was an internal investigation being conducted. So I feel like sometimes these companies hire law firms or what have you to conduct these internal investigations, and they already know what they want the outcome of the investigation to be. So how do you see this ending? Uh, personally, from my like, from my personal viewpoint, uh, I don't see him going out uh, of the company at, at any point. The, the the word among wrestling fans has always been, or sort of like the thought amongst wrestling fans, is that he will be the one to go down with the ship. He'll be doing this until his dying day. He is a man that reportedly only sleeps for two hours a day uh, because he's so busy working and uh, working on the company, working on various different things. And you know, it, it, I I think if this was something that he was taking seriously um it, he would have stepped down completely he would have completely stepped down as ceo and also as head of creative and he wouldn't be at any of the shows i think the fact that he is still at shows i think the fact that he's still going out on tv every now and again shows that this is not facing him whatsoever and he is pretty confident that nothing will happen to him and i i think he will remain in charge of this company until he either unfortunately passes away or he hands it off to someone else of his own choosing. He will he will go when he is ready to go. He will not be pushed. I, I think I could see that too. I mean, he's 76 years old and he's still in charge. So it seems to me sending a very clear message that this is my, my thing. I'm not going anywhere. Uh, well, this is his empire. Yeah, definitely. Well, Luke Owen, general manager of Wrestle Talk and ho host of the Wrestle Talk podcast, found on YouTube. Thanks again for coming on Sidebar to talk about the latest with Vince McMahon. Thank you for having me. And that's it for this edition of Law and Crime Sidebar Podcast. It is produced by Sam Goldberg and Michael Dininger. Bobby Zoki is our YouTube manager. Kiara Bronson handles our social media. And Alyssa Fisher is our booking producer. You can find Sidebar on Apple, Spotify, Google, YouTube, of course, and wherever else you get your podcasts. I'm Anjanette Levy, and we will see you next time.